All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us for our first of this kind of levy conversation, both in person and via Zoom. Um, as you know, we're continually growing and learning as an organization to meet the needs of our community. So we decided to take it a step further and, and create an opportunity <clears throat> that people could join us both in person and also remotely for this opportunity to learn a little bit more about our levy, our levies uh, for November 7th. So to get things started this evening, what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend about four or five minutes, watch our informational video on the levies. And then I will explain the process for taking questions and responding to our attendees this evening. So you guys online could give us about the next four or five minutes. Hopefully you can all see our, see our screen and we're gonna start the video. For more than a century, the Kent School District has provided an excellent education for children. With the help of our community, we will continue this tradition of excellence. There are two critical levies requiring voter approval on the November 7th ballot. These levies play a crucial role in providing the necessary resources, technology, and learning environments for students to develop the skills needed to thrive in a global society. These funds will be used to prepare students navigate an interconnected world and foster a sense of empathy and understanding for different cultures and perspectives. The replacement educational programs and operations levy will provide nearly 15% of the district's funding for all elementary, middle, and high school operations. This levy currently accounts for $74 million in annual funding including over $40 million in salary costs not funded by the state. This levy funds almost all safety staff. Currently, the state only funds 25% of these employees. The EPO levy funds nearly 20 positions above state allocations for school health and support services to meet the unique health and social emotional needs of our students. This replacement levy funds 30% of special education, along with highly capable, multilingual, and dual language programs, and supports reduced class sizes. This levy will fund advanced coursework, such as advanced placement and international baccalaureate programs. It will fund all athletics and activities for students such as music, art, and drama productions for a well-rounded education. While the proposed EPO levy funds critical operational costs, the proposed capital and technology levy will provide the majority of health and safety funding over the next four years. It will fund upgrades to current alarm systems at every school across the district and HVAC systems to provide healthy air and cooling systems in our schools. Proposition 2 will fund classroom technology tools and infrastructure for teaching and learning so students are prepared for the careers of tomorrow. It will continue the maintenance of the one to one program to ensure our data and information remain secure. This measure will fund critical repairs to boilers and roof replacements, provide new paint and flooring, and pay for new synthetic fields at our high schools. Capital and technology levy would provide preschool programs along with accessible and inclusive playground equipment at elementary schools. We believe every child, regardless of background, deserves an opportunity to achieve their potential by receiving an excellent education in a technology-rich and well-maintained school. With voter approval of these levies, the local school district portion of property taxes on a home value at $500,000 to be approximately $1,832 to continue providing quality education for our students. In short, if both measures are passed, the overall tax rates for school funding are projected to drop by 9.8%, which will be the lowest tax rate in recent recorded history. Like the subscription, local school levies must be renewed. Failure of either of these levies would mean significant reductions in staff and student services including teaching and paraeducator positions, our one-to-one -one technology program, and much needed critical repairs. Your vote is important to every student in our community. Look for your ballot in the mail after October 18th and be sure your voice is heard by mailing or dropping your ballot before November 7th. 
Thank you for voting. All right. Okay, so we've got about 55 more minutes, which I think is plenty of time for an opportunity to learn about your questions you may have and hopefully get the responses that you're looking for uh, from those of us that are here to, to share these information with you this evening. What I'd like to do is some just quick introductions of those of us that are sitting on the dais here ask, answering questions this evening so you know who's here, and then I'll walk you through the process for question answering as well. Uh, my name is Wade Berenger. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of the Kent School District. My name is Ben Rarick. I'm the Associate Superintendent of Finance. I'm Dave Buzzard. I'm the Executive Director of Operations. My name is Dave Sisley, and I'm the Director of Communications. Hi. So tonight, questions will be answered for those who are attending in person first. Next, we will go to those on Zoom with their uh, hands are raised. If you have a question, you raise your hand. If you'd like to verbally share your question, you'll be the next to be called on. And then after all those questions are answered, we'll move on to questions that are posted in the chat. And then we'll read those questions from the chat, and then we will answer those questions accordingly as well. So we'll continue using this process throughout the evening as necessary. So with that said, do we have any hands raised in our Zoom? Gary. Uh, Gary, looks like your hand's raised. Go ahead. We're going to allow you to unmute and give us your question. Go ahead, Gary. Gary, we're not able to hear you. We can hear just a very, very faint sound of, of a voice, but we're not able to hear or make out uh, anything that you're saying. Is that better? That is better. That's perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, figuring out technology. Anyway, my question <laughs> is, um, did you... Did you change any of the appropriation requests from the last time you submitted the vote levy to the voters to this time that's coming up? And if so, what did you change? So Gary, that's a great question. I just want to clarify your question, that question. Are you referring to the bond that we ran last spring and that failed? Or are you referring to the previous uh, EPNO and our capital technology levies of um, 2022 and 2018. Okay, I guess I <clears throat> I was thinking that it was the bond uh, from last spring. So yeah, no these these two are both uh, levies. One's the educational programs and operations levy, and then one is the capital and technology capital levy. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Other hands raised. Any questions in the chat? All right, we'll just we'll just hang out. So feel free to raise your hand, come off mute, ask a question. Feel free to put a question in the chat. We'll read that out loud and answer that for you as well. So we'll just, we'll just wait and monitor um, our attendees. And we do appreciate you being here this evening. Feel free to ask any questions about either one of our levies. While you're thinking about either raising your hand or putting a question in the chat, uh, just know that you can access information regarding the current levy uh, right there on our district website. So if you go to the Kent School District website, you click on the button across the banner where it says Our District, 
you click on the bonds and levies tab, and that'll open up uh, multiple pieces there. It'll open up the 2023 levies, which will go through the entire uh, description of, of both the levies we're running. There's also a 2023 FAQ frequently asked questions page that you can scroll through those questions and also find the answers by clicking on those questions. That also may help uh, provide additional information um, as you're um, considering uh, your uh, vote in November. Okay, sounds like we've got a question. Just one second. Question is, um, do all districts have the same levy? So a, a quick answer to that is um, because the state of Washington does not fully fund education, all districts are in a position, depending on their need for financial uh, support, are in a position to run levies. They may be educational program and operational levies, uh, as, as one of our levies are. They also may be capital and technology levies as well. So um, all districts are in the same position that the Kent School District is, as far as going out and running levies to help supplement the funding that the state does not fully fund, to be able to continue to maintain the high quality education that they have going on in their districts. They may be run at a different level as far as a different uh, value or dollar amount, but most districts across the state are in the exact same position, um, leaning on their taxpayers and voters to help support uh, the district. I hope that answers your question. Any other hands or questions? Again, I, I encourage you if you're online and you're you're listening to the questions and answers, or if you want to find more information right now about uh, our levies, again, um, feel free to jump on our website, take a look at our bonds and levies website page, the FAQs, or the information specifically regarding our levies that are coming up in November. There's videos in there that you can see for additional resources. There's information in there, flyers and posters that are in multiple languages. Information about taxes. Dr. Berenger, do you also want to let them know that if they come up with a question maybe after this, how they can get a hold of us? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Buzzard. Buzzard. Um, yeah, if you have questions when this session is over, uh, we have another session on October 26th as well. It'll look exactly like this one. But at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can always email. Um, we have a KSD Levy email. You can email myself. Um, all of our contact information is on the website. So as soon as you open the Bonds and Levies page, you'll have contact information of those people that are um, that can support and responses to the questions you might have regarding the levies. So anytime you have questions, please feel free to reach out. If you're hearing things out there in the community and you have questions or you want to even encourage your neighbors or friends to reach out to us if they have questions, if you're thinking that they have information that maybe isn't accurate, or if you if they're asking how they could be more informed, please encourage them to reach out to us, or to at least to uh, go to, go to the uh, website and check out our information. So we got another question here: Are there any efforts to increase state funding for education? <laughs> yes. Uh, and I would say the efforts are that um, every time the legislation is in session, there is a push on the legislation to um, 
revisit the idea of fully funding education. So um, I would say that it is not something that uh, uh, is dismissed by educators and districts around the state pushing on their le local legislators every single session. Um, so fortunately, it's a political decision that comes down to it. Um, but it is not because people have not continued to push uh, our state senators and representatives uh, to move in that direction. And I encourage any of my team members up here to jump in and add to any of the responses I've given as well. Another question, are these cost estimate breakdowns available for us to see for each project or line item um, the levies are expected to fund? Would like to see how the amounts were arrived at. Thank you. So the quick answer for that as well as um, just uh, I'll go back to a definition um, between the definition of a bond versus the definition of a levy. Uh, a bond is uh, very different than a levy. A bond is something that we are um, uh, that we go to the board with and share every single project. Um, so that's something that we are obligated to do, uh, and we do that. And levy is different um, in that we have shared in the resolution for this particular levy, as well as in, in all of our documents, those big buckets of projects. Um, levies allow us to be able to adjust as the years go on based on the critical needs and repairs of our buildings, based on our annual needs assessments. So every year we do assessments on our buildings. And if we were to come out and say right now and say, here's our 47 projects for this levy, and they're all named by exactly what they are, how much they're going to cost for every single school, and then something happens at the end of this year, we need a roof replaced, and we don't have access to those funds because we've already obligated ourselves 47 specific projects, then it doesn't allow us to be able to... Uh, or use that levy funds for those critical repairs that come up based off of our annual needs assessments. So what we've done is we've created big buckets of projects where we know a majority of the projects will live um, without specifically calling out exactly what those projects are and then limiting us and not being able to um, uh, access those levy funds to actually do the uh, um, just-in-time repairs as they're needed. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah, Dr. Mirage, I'd like to jump in there as well. Um, one of the reasons why we're, and transparency is a big thing, I understand that uh, wholeheartedly. The, the reason why most districts do not put a, a project amount of what that budget is, is because it allows our vendors who are competing to, um, uh, to procure that project as we're as out for bid. Um, we don't want to give them a number to start at or something that they can just throw a dart at. So we want them to do their due diligence and make sure that they are um, uh, estimating the project for exactly what is on the drawings and the specifications and the addendums. So that's one of the reasons why we do not do that on levies uh, and or bonds. Great, we've got another question. And uh, this one's gonna send right to you, Dave. Hello, according to the email sent today, there were 62 projects not yet started from the 2018 levy. Did that money get used for something else or is it still in the working budget? Great question. So uh, anytime you see an update from uh, KSD where it says not started, uh, that means that that project has not begun the, um, uh, the starting point of how our project comes to um, begin. What that is is that it's set on a priority scale. And then once that priority scale comes up, uh, our um, assistant director of capital projects, Brett Scribner, pulls that and sets a date to it to say, okay, we're going to start uh, pre-design, go into design, then permit, and then construction. So just because it says it's not started, those funds are there, should be there for that particular project. It just means that that has not started the procedural process in the capital projects team as a starting project. Thank you. I just want to be, I just want to, I want to, I want to ask this part of the question one more time so you can be very clear on your response. So 
Did all the money for those projects get used up? Are they still in the budget? They are still in the budget. Thank you. All right. Good. Um, next question. Uh, do we have any hands raised? I'm just checking because I know that's that's okay. Great. We're just going to questions in the chat. And then we're in the audience. I'm not sure. Oh, if I want to see any questions. No, do any questions? Okay. okay. Anytime you have a question, just let us know. Okay. Um, how much were districts able to raise under the old levy system? Just curious, have not had a chance to visit the website, and how often can school districts run levies? Dan, you want to take that one? Sure. Okay, well, I appreciate the question. Um, there's been several different uh, old levy systems, so we've had many different levy systems in our history. Um, uh, I would say that um, the Washington went through a period of uh, gradually increasing local levies, and then the legislature uh, adopted some legislation about, let's see, roughly 10 years ago, I would say, uh, that adopted some, some limits, uh, both from a uh, property rate standpoint, uh, and a per people standpoint. And gradually over time, the legislature has adjusted uh, those limitations. But I suppose the reason I go through that is so that you understand that all school districts are sort of operating under those same limitations. Um, so I wouldn't be able to give you like a dollar amount in terms of how much they were able to raise under the old system, but it has fluctuated generally depending upon the political party in charge. And um, if you had any additional clarifying questions on that, I'd be happy to field them. But you asked the second question, which was how frequently can school districts run levies? So, um, generally speaking, uh, districts, I mean, districts can run two year, three year, four year. I believe they can run all the way up to six year levies. So, how frequently you run a levy is uh, premised on how long the levy currently happens. So uh, in recent years, Kent has uh, chosen to run shorter levies, uh, two-year levies. Um, and so as a result, uh, Kent has gone back to the voters more frequently, obviously, because they're going back every two years. Um, I think the most frequent practice is probably three years, uh, three to four years. And so the uh, measure before you uh, essentially incorporates a three-year EPNO levy and a four-year capital. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, but if it did, uh, I'm sure you'll clarify in the chat. All right, looks like we have another question, um, not so much associated with the levy, but I can definitely ask it and um, try to answer it. And I'm thinking it says, are there any alternative universities that are available for masters in teaching is what I would think that says. Um, there's there's a lot of universities uh, in the state of Washington, outside the state of Washington online that you can get your masters in teaching. Um, if that was the question. Um, and if you have questions about that and you're, you're currently looking at becoming a teacher and getting a master's in education, um, you can also reach out to the district and we can help uh, point you in the right direction of a university or school that can support you in that. And also, if you're looking for a teaching position, the ASD is always looking for great <coughs> candidates. All right, we have a question from the audience. Yes. Yes. Um, what about levies for paraeducators? So um, the, our levies that we have, so this one of our, our levies, the EPNL levy, which is the Educational Programs and Operations Levy, helps support um, funding teachers, paraeducators, uh, and, and programs throughout our district. So uh, the EPNL levy is uh, a critical levy to support um, our, our ongoing staffing uh, or positions like paraeducators. Hands raised. Do we have a question coming in? Oh, 
Okay. Well, let's wait. Be patient. Just wanted to say we really appreciate the people that have uh, chimed in here tonight uh, as part of this. We know that this is very important work and, you know, uh, we just want to make sure that we, that the, the community understands that, um, you know, you are a vital part of what we do. You are the whole part of what we do. And we just appreciate you uh, coming alongside of us today to ask us questions and confirm anything that, uh, that you are uh, in need of answering. We have uh, Jeannie Johnson. Jeannie Johnson, do you have a question? Hi there, thank you. I'm curious how the money in the EPNO will be used for paraeducators. Will there be like uh, bonuses or something to encourage more hiring? I know we've hired a lot of paraeducators recently and they had a raise, but I'm just curious are we making up for money that's needed to pay them? Or how does that work? What is the, I don't know my question, what is the money for or how will it be used for paraeducators? Sure, I appreciate the question very much. Um, and you're right to point out that um, paraeducators have, um, I believe relatively recently been renegotiated. Um, there's obviously some costs associated with that to the district. And so this is a, uh, two things I want to emphasize. The first thing is uh, certainly there are a number of programs that rely pretty heavily on their educators that are not anywhere near fully funded by the state. Um, a deputy superintendent Mariner mentioned a few earlier, but our uh, special education program is probably tops on that list. Um, our uh, MLE program, um, just to name a couple, I can say for sure off the top of my head that those two, the local levy funds, um, the enhancements in paraeducators that are not funded by the state. Now, the other thing I wanna emphasize here is that, um, you know, despite what you may have read, um, this is actually a pretty cautious let me ask. So we were very cognizant of the fact that um, tax sensitivity is very high right now. Um, and people want to see that every last dollar um, that is being requested of them is being uh, responsibly and conservatively budgeted for. And so just to emphasize that there's not a lot of new expensive plans that are built into this levy. Um, this levy was really designed to be conservative to the, to the ask to our voters to say, this is a, a, in essence, a, a maintenance levy, and that the only amounts that we're asking to increase here are to keep pace with the costs of our current obligations. Um, and so I know that most of you have read that our estimates are you know, about three to three and a half percent, uh, basically year to year. Now, remember, uh, inflation for us last year was 3.7%. So that's roughly over the course of the levy, sort of consistent um, with where inflation has been. So, A, yes, absolutely robustly supports our value pair educators in this community. But on the other hand, it doesn't make a lot of uh, big promises as to new programs. It is a maintenance levy in that respect. Thank you very much for the question though. Thank you. We'll give Dr. Berenger a break here for a second. If there's any more uh, hands to be raised or Anybody else have any more questions? Again, we're here. We're going to stay here and monitor for the entire hour uh, until we're done. So we just, again, appreciate you uh, joining online. And those of you who have shown up in person, we appreciate you as well. Uh, Dr. Berenger, if I can say a word briefly. So Absolutely. the other thing I wanted to say in this space um, is that um, it's, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to answer questions. 
Uh, and obviously this impacts our work that we do uh, all year. But we're also kind of sitting here in this space as officials of the school district. So uh, we're not in a position to be persuading you. Um, and everything that we say here is meant to be factual in nature, uh, objective in nature, and not to sort of go over that line to be persuasive or meant or be perceived as campaigning. And so I thought if I said that out loud for the record, people might understand why we're being so judicious in our responses so that people don't misconstrue that, right? Um, so if you were expecting more enthusiasm or a different sort of language, it's just our opportunity to be very respectful of that law that governs uh, our behavior as school district employees. We do have a comment in the uh, chat and uh, Farrell said thank you for Thank you all for setting up this informative session. So uh, we appreciate that as well, too. I see we have people interested in getting alternative certifications so they don't do much. But good luck to do what we can have some kind of revenue. While we're waiting, Faith, do you want to maybe uh, say something about if uh, someone has a, uh, a different language and how they contact the district in a different language uh, with their question? Um, yes, you can email translations at kent.k1g.wa.us and reach an interpreter there. And we would even be able to contact you uh, and then answer questions in that language. So feel free to email that. Email your questions to translations at Kent.k as well. Our website also translates, so all the information that we're talking about here today, our website translates into 77 languages. So you can use the translate button, which is at the top left of the screen, and translate the website into one of those languages. If you have questions beyond that, um, you can click on that email address that is posted on that page and uh, Type in your language, and we will get it interpreted and translated back to you. Great. Yeah. All right. I'm here. one of the three people here, so I figure ask some questions. Andre Cook, I am a uh, Kent School District staff member, but I am always concerned about our local schools and wanting to support students wherever they may live. A big narrative that goes on in the community is that there may be some overlap of this levy and the capital levy um, and that we're double dipping. And so I just wanted to ask, are we double dipping? What's going on so that we can maybe have the same page um, in our community on this topic? And then I have other questions after that. Okay, great. Good morning. Great question. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I also got wind of this, this double dipping comment. Um, and we took the step of writing out a response. So, just so you know, in addition to what I have to say here, there's something in writing, I think, on that. Um, I suspect that maybe this. Um, comes from confusion about why we're going out in November versus going out in February. Um, and I think people are attributing that essentially 90 day difference to um, some sort of double dipping, but um, I'll just try to slowly walk through both on the, there's two parts of this, there's the PPL and then there's capital and technology web. Um, and I'll sort of try to walk through that very plain spoken language, not only for you, but I know others are listening as well. Um, but there's no double dipping is the executive summary, uh, skipping to the conclusion here. Um, uh, with the EPNL levy, um, the district was gonna have to go out for an EPNL renewal 
anyway. It was just a question of when to go out, right? So a number of us have been in the school district for a number of years and, and all know that very typically the school district will go out in February. That's a pretty common time to go out. And had we not had um, capital considerations, we probably would have gone out in February. Now, again, we're talking about a 90 day difference, right? Uh, it's, it's not a year difference, it's not a year difference. It's, it's, it's essentially whether you're going to go out um, before the end of the year or just after the start of the year. Um, the reason for going out in November this time was that we felt like there obviously the, the bond had not passed. Right, and obviously the community communicated to the Kent School District that that wasn't going to happen. Um, it came in, I believe, forty-eight percent, so it wasn't like right on the edge, and so that's forced some some conversations and some recalibration uh, within the organization. I think it's fair to say about okay, if that's not going to happen, um, what considerably more modest ask. Uh, could have. And within the context of that conversation, when should we go out for that portion? Because again, there's two of these, right? There's the PL and there's the capital cycle. By going out when we are in November, it gives the district and the community an opportunity to support us in calendar year 24. If we had gone out 90 days later, that opportunity is gone for the whole year. Now, the reason that's not a double bit is because it's not gonna, it's not gonna increase the overall tax burden to the taxpayers any more than uh, what we were uh, originally projecting in terms of a flat tax rate and percentage increases. It was our one last opportunity to establish a collection in calendar year 24, where one previously wouldn't exist. So not only is it not a, like a double bit, it's actually our sort of last opportunity to do anything there. For that portion in calendar year 20. Okay. Um, I think people find levies and taxes and tax rates very confusing. There's a lot of, you know, and I, I do the best I can to sort of step back and say, what's the simplest way to explain this? And, and at the end of the day, people pay one tax bill, right? They get one bill. It doesn't, you know, they don't get four different bills for the different levies, so they just get a bill, right? And at the end of the day, we don't know anything about any of the individual's piece of property, but we can say to you, based on what we're projecting, based on the amounts we're asking, it's more or less about 3% increase each year. Now, if your property is assessed differently than that, if there's something going on with your personal piece of property, you can't control that, right? But in terms of the amount we're asking for, it's a commensurate for inflation. So I'm having a hard time understanding how that would constitute any sort of double dipping. It's pretty conventional approach and it's a pretty conservative approach. You know, there are certain districts out there um, that have successfully asked for quite a bit more. So it was an attempt on our part in view of the results of the bond to be like, okay, clearly this is a message and we need to recalibrate, be a little bit more conservative in that ask. So how do we do that responsibly? And the, the last question I have, um, not to take all the time, uh, there is, we're running a capital levy. And so people like to say that we just, we're running the bond again, um, that we've taken projects. What was that feedback cycle and how were these pieces selected? And uh, what is the difference between the bonds that didn't pass and this capital levy? Yeah. Um, so great question. So in the bond, uh, that was uh, you know, a very exhaustive list of things that uh, we in the district uh, through um, outside sources, third party and within the district uh, put together a, a exhaustive list of things that we felt over the next six to eight years, that's what we would need uh, in the district. Um, four years, four to six years, sorry. Um, when that uh, when that didn't pass, um, we actually did a survey. We went out to our community and we conducted a survey. We got a lot of feedback from that survey. 
Um, so what we did with that is we took that information and we said, okay, what do we scale back uh, for a moderate, very conservative look at what we need to do uh, to keep our buildings uh, in order uh, before our next bond? Because the district will go out for another bond at some point uh, because building bonds are for buildings, levies are for learning and, and other things. So that's what we want to want to do. Uh, in retrospect to what the levy is, it's not that we just cut off certain projects. It's things on the bond were in priority level. So it was, e it was easy for us to take the survey from the community and our priority level and really scale those projects back to get uh, kind of a list that we can come to uh, that's not defined, but we can go to the board each year and say, okay, here are the things that need to be done in this year with this amount of money, this is what we need to do. I think we have some online stuff. Right? What do you do? Um, ben kind of alluded to this, but I think we can come back and answer it more clearly. The Q&A online says the capital projects slash tech levy cannot be run again if it fails. Can you explain why this is the case? Um, I can say that that's, that's not the case. Right. If the capital tech levy that we're running as one of our two levies in November, if it fails, we can run it one more time in calendar year 2024. One more time, and can uh, elaborate on that. It really does depend upon, we've seen different phrasing of this question. So to be clear, let's talk first about the capital and technology budget. If it fails in November, there is not a second opportunity to run it for collection needed in calendar year 2024. So that the tax collection in 2024, there's no second chance at that. Okay. Now certainly there is a second chance to run it in terms of uh, collection in 2025 and beyond. And that is also true for the um, now, state law, uh, if memory serves, paraphrase, it's basically that, that school districts get uh, two opportunities to do this each calendar year. So let's talk about how the EPNL look. So if, um, if the uh, EPNL look were to fail in November, the school district would get one more opportunity to run that prior to collection starting in calendar year 2025. So sometime between November 17th uh, and the following November. Now, because there's that little extra month there, we asked the attorney, like, no, nope, the attorney's very clear. This counts as one, there will be one additional in the following year. So um, in the unlikely fortunate event that both of those were to fail, then you're talking about an EPNL levy not collected starting in January of 2025, which would affect budgeting, contracts, and staffing 2024, 2025 school year, which is next year. So even though you think about 2025 as a long ways away, it's half of next school year. So we would budget for considerably less local revenue, you essentially get sort of half of the year's revenue, if you will, for the 2024, 2025 school year. And then the following, it would be the full, what it means roughly it would be two to three million dollars. So so that's that's the answer to that question. You get two chances each calendar year, but in this particular case with the capital levy, there's only one chance for me because you're in the way. Thank you, Ben. Um, there's a question I answered in the chat, but I'll just read it out loud and answer it out loud. Um, can you tell me more about more information about installing uh, turf on middle school baseball fields and the connection to Kent Parks? And we don't currently have baseball and softball in middle schools. Um, the middle school turf or synthetic fields uh, was on the bond. Uh, so it was high school synthetic and middle school synthetic on the bond. And with the bond failing and obviously coming out with a much smaller uh, capital levy, um, we're moving forward as far as uh, the priority being high school synthetic fields, 
no longer the priority being middle schools in the Bennett field. So that's not that's not on the uh, the docket for the current levy uh, for November. Um, not that it won't come up again at some point. Um, districts all around us are are moving well through their high schools with synthetic fields and, and also we're moving on to their middle schools having synthetic fields. And so uh, that will have to wait uh, for another bond uh, down the line. So another question, um, community survey conducted after the bond failure indicated the community is looking for more accountability. How would you respond to those that say a levy has less accountability for capital improvements than a bond and question the decision to put a levy on the ballot for capital improvements rather than a bond. Well, um, the quick answer to that is uh, a bond is sixty percent, so it's a it's super majority. Um, it it uh, I think we proved in April that forty eight percent is nowhere near sixty percent, and so um, that uh, and again I know we've stated this publicly and I'll say it again was a wake up call uh, in a lot of ways for us to uh, have conversations around how can we do things differently? What do we need to do differently? We surveyed our community. We hear your comments in that community feedback. Um, it doesn't, it, it would not make sense for us to go out for another bond knowing that we had an eb and levy coming back up for renewal, knowing that we had a capital tech uh, levy that would be coming back out as well. And to go out for to our community and say, hey, we're gonna go for a bond that we just failed by 12% six months ago. And in February, 90 days later, we're gonna go out for double levies. That's that's just a lot to ask of our taxpayers. And that's just not something that we are willing to do. And so um, we, through lots of conversations, um, the failure of that bond uh, has, led to a lot of reflective conversations around where we are in the Kent School District, where we want to do, what we want to do moving forward uh, in our bonds and with our bonds. Um, and so we decided to, to pause and move into that space that we knew we, knew, we knew we needed to do, which was the renewal of our uh, EPNO levy. That's something we have to do. Um, and then the, the, uh, the, um, our, uh, sorry, capital and technology levy as well. So those are pieces that allow us to continue doing the work that we're doing in the district. Um, and that was a priority over thinking that we can go back out and run a bond nine months later and figuring that we had 12 extra percent of support there. Um, we, we have work to do um, as a district. We're working hard, uh, continuing to, to build that trust with our community and, and um, uh, we're still doing that. So. There you go. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah. Ben, you have a, you have a yeah. piece there. I would I would just say that uh, a couple of times we've heard the comments about uh, capital levies being less accountable. And I'm not I just wouldn't necessarily want that us to just get by that without I, i'm not sure that there would be differences of opinion about what that exactly means um you know the board of course still adopts the capital facilities plan they still uh approve uh, certain transactions and purchases and so i wouldn't want to give anybody the impression that there's a loss or lack of accountability in that space the statute defines the two different so there's a different um, set of tasks and different, um, you know, obviously bond purchasers and uh, bond graders are not involved in capital technology revenue related. So the, the process is different. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that it is less accountable. I suppose that would depend on someone's opinion of what that means. But I just wanted to reflect on that point. Great point, Ben. I just want to clarify one thing is that uh, in the capital projects process, um, we have to, capital projects have to come to the board for any new project that wants to be done. So if it's being done with a levy dollars or bond dollars, if it is not already on a list somewhere, we have to come to the board 
of directors and bring that for their discussion and approval or consent. Uh, so that does take place um, and they are fully aware of what that project is and what the proposed cost will be. Any other questions? Are there any questions that ended up in the chat that we didn't ask or any clarification on? It looks like I got a request to clarify okay. something because Rick's plan wasn't being fully turned up by the money, but um, the amount of, I think this is a reference to the, um, the sort of one and done here with the capital portion for the calendar year 2024. That amount would be about $29.2 million of funding in tax collections that would be that the district would essentially uh, forego, forfeit if the levy did not pass in the room. That would be the uh, uh, calendar year 2024 amount. So I think somebody was asking you to clarify the amount. So that's great. All right, we've got another question here. So there is a current six-year capital and tech levy that was voted on in 2018. Do you think this creates confusion with voters to have two levies with the same name and purpose? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Dr. Berenger, as far as the capital portion of it. So the 2018 levy, um, yes, when you look at a six-year levy or a four-year levy, uh, however that works in the capital world, uh, when those funds come in for a levy, that is based off of tax collection. So uh, we have to collect those taxes in April and October, if I'm correct, then um, through the year. And then we can um, pull those projects up to be able to fund those projects. Now, the... Um, projects start out, again, it goes through the process. There's a pre-design, design, design uh, goes to permit, goes to construction, and then completion. So in six years, uh, the current uh, bond or the current levy right now has about, I want to say, 380 projects on there. So we will still be finishing projects up for the 2018 levy as we go out for this levy, preparing for the next bulk of projects that we would want to do on a priority level. If, if priority comes to fruition. So again, uh, I don't think in in um, in looking at this, if it's if it creates confusion, I think what some people may want to understand is that even bonds, capital bonds, overlap capital bonds, and capital levies overlap capital levies. Projects are not going to be started and finished at the completion before you go out for another bond and or levy. And that just keeps um, uh, you know, uh, our, our, the listing of our projects that we want to keep going, especially in bonds. If we want to start building buildings, um, then we would want to go do that and keep doing that on an every uh, four to six year basis um, to keep those dollars coming in. But again, capital dollars will overlap the next bond and they will overlap the next levy. They don't drag out uh, for long periods of time. Um, they shouldn't. And they won't going forward for us, but I can tell you that they will have some type of overlap. Anyone else want to respond? You know, this, I was thinking as that as I reread that question a couple different times now. Um, the only thing that uh, and I'm thinking about like does it create confusion? Well, it's a six year capital levy. It runs six years, 2018 to 2024. Um, you know, I think we've been pretty clear in the last couple months going out in November of 2023 with the idea of only collecting the 29.2 million dollars for the capital in 2024 um and so uh that could be the piece but i mean i think we've been really clear in our explanation on that i think this is uh, to your point i think that this question is is all about the 90 days so if we had gone out in february and just run renewal you know technology i suspect that people would not be 
asking this question. It's going out 90 days earlier and understanding that 29.2 million. And very simply, that's just priority for capital projects um, that the district uh, wanted to take an opportunity to try to collect in the calendar year 24. It was one last opportunity to do that. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, for those of us who are unable to vote, is there anything we can do to help the cause? So I don't think that we can answer that question. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna answer that question by saying that unfortunately we're not able to answer that question. Um, but what I can say is there are outside organizations uh, that you could come in contact with uh, that will support you in that uh, endeavor. I think the biggest thing is just stay educated. You're here on this. You're asking these questions. You're getting responses from us. You're able to hopefully share what you've learned with your friends and neighbors, family members, things like that. Um, encourage them to look at our website to get the information. Um, I think that's what we can do. Would KSD consider no longer referring to property tax rates and instead focus on dollar changes when providing information about the tax impact? I think the tax rate messaging, uh, e.g. tax rate, will be lower than in the past, causes a lot of confusion and potential loss of trust in the process. Great question. Yes, you can have that. We've had this conversation several times. This is, a, this is the ultimate frequently asked question. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the question. Um, so, you know, first of all, I think the the answer is no, we would not be able to do that. Um, uh, the the levy resolutions, the explanatory statements, um, most of those incorporate tax rates. Um, and tax rates are considered, you know, not just we can, but I think if any, the ballot measure and the levy that authorizes that ballot measure, the explanatory statement that accompanies that ballot measure, if you pulled that in any school district, I think, um, you would see that it reflects both information about the tax rate and information about the tax amount. Um, and for certainly as long as I've been in this district, and certainly even before that, um, uh, there has been both pieces of information provided. And there's good reason to have both pieces of information. Um, tax rate information provides valuable information to voters. That's why uh, the ballot measures include them. Um, but but it is a correct uh, statement. The point is well made. Um, that both are important because just because your tax rate goes down does not mean that your tax bill will go down. And the inverse is also true. Uh, part of what drives the interest of tax rates is that people are fond of comparing their tax burden relative to neighboring communities and peer communities or even peer states. And it provides a mechanism for creating a sort of comparative framework that uh, just tax amounts do not. But I will say that because we received this question um, quite a bit during the, the bond, we actually sort of went out of our way and made a special effort to uh, do an entire section on the board work session just on tax amounts, just on theoretical values of homes and the you know a likely tax amount and tax increases as a result of that. I believe all of that's been posted to our website. And certainly every time that I have had an opportunity and the pleasure to present the board or the community. Um, I, I'm pretty careful about informing folks about um, the, the three and a half percent um, estimate that we're putting out. I'll add again that uh, depending upon rates of new construction in the community, depending upon what property somebody happens to own and the assessment of that property, that may or may not manifest for an individual's piece of property. But it's a good faith estimate on our part. 
reflecting the total dollar amounts that are increasing over the period of the of the levy. So um, this continues to be um, something of interest. And for anybody who wants to kind of go back and listen to the board work session prior to the authorization of the levy, we listen to probably 30 minutes on this topic. Uh, oh, well, a dedicated conversation about the dollar amounts per levy and the combined amount, um, specifically because board members asked for it. And so the last thing I wanted to note is that King County, you know, back, back in the day, people had to do sort of their own math, sort of try to do, figure out what this might do for their property. But King County now creates what they call their tax transparency tool. It's an online um, um, calculator, if you will, where you can go. I believe you, I've used it a couple times. Uh, you go and you can type your address, you type in your, your home address. Um, and then I believe anything that's on the ballot for that next cycle, it will give you sort of a best case, you know, best case, like a, like a, a good faith estimate. Again, it's not, it's not going to be um, what they show um, because it's pre-assessment and all that, but but it's a good faith estimate. Um, and you might find that anybody listening this evening who would like to sort of take a look at that might find that to be a helpful and interesting tool. Um, so I can recommend that uh, to folks as well. Yeah, and if you're online, it's, it's right there in the chat. It's also right on the bonds and levies tax information tab. So you can put on that, scroll down a little bit, and the tax transparency tool is right there. That's something we put out before the bond. Uh, we felt it was really important as we were continuing to try to make sure that we were transparent and sharing and giving our community opportunities to get all of the information that they possibly would need to make an informed decision. Uh, we felt it was important they had access to, to that information. Well, it is 7.02. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time, those who joined us in person and those who joined us on Zoom this evening. Again, we have another opportunity on October 26th, same time, same place. Um, and again, any time between now and then and November 7th, if you have questions, we encourage you uh, to please reach out to us uh, via email, check out our website, um, and uh, let us um, support you in any way we can. Again, thank you very much for your time this evening. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Very nice. Appreciate, Appreciate the questions and the thoughtful dialogue. Thank you. You're welcome.